Hello. Uh, welcome to this session. Uh, last year, I did a session about misogyny with Michael Kaufman, who is obviously a man, a Canadian, uh, who has spent his professional life debating feminism in order to encourage men to understand that they can be feminists, support feminism, and spends a lot of time discussing gender equality with boys and men. And he was part of the Being a Man Festival that we did a few weeks ago. Um, and when I said to him I want to discuss misogyny, uh, he said that's a very dangerous subject. And he was delighted, and, he, you know, and it was an interesting discussion. But um, it, it re I realized that it was one of those words which people are very frightened to discuss and that part of the backlash against the feminist movement of the 70s uh, m brought with it a whole idea that words that were confrontational needed to be avoided as if they were weapons that, could, that would ultimately only create destruction and couldn't be used to further any understanding. Um, but I wanted to revisit the word misogyny myself, and I'll, I'll before I introduce Anne in detail, Anne Summers in detail, and tell, tell you why I invited her, I found myself watching a f couple of years ago um, a documentary report about Egypt and the, uh, the Arab uprising. And I found myself uh, listening to a, a number of young women who'd been taken into custody after protesting in Tahrir Square and they had been taken into custody, and then they had in prison been examined. They'd been given examinations by male guards to find out whether they were virgins in order to be able to demonstrate that if they were not virgins, that that was because, you know, being radical in Tahrir Square was the likely reason why they'd lost their virginity. In other words, it was a relationship between radical behavior and, and sexual morality. And the girls, the women, were talking about what that did to them, that this assault on them. And I, I found myself crying uncontrollably uh, in front of somebody who I didn't know very well, a man. And he said, well, you know, do you know any of them? Or, you know, what's the sort of point about this? Why are you crying so much? And I said, I, when I realize sometimes that I, I am hated for being a woman, I mean, hated. I, I don't know how, to, I don't know what to do with that feeling. I don't know where to go with that feeling. It makes me feel so vulnerable and so baffled. Um, and of course, you know, you can't just stay crying your eyes out. Uh, but it was, it was when I realized that I had to explain to a man, you know, who was, who was very loving, that actually there is this thing called misogyny and it really does exist as far as I can feel it. Then it made me want to come back out again with the word and say, you know, do we acknowledge it? Is it true? And, and how do you know it's there? Because all of these things, you know, how do you prove it? What, how, what's the proof that love exists? What is the proof that friendship exists? What is the proof that misogyny exists? And uh, th then I read uh, Anne Summer's book, The Misogyny Factor, and met her in Australia. Uh, when we did wow, uh, uh, wow Sydney, and thought that it would be fantastic to ask her to come over to Wow. So she agreed, thank goodness. Um, Dr. Anne Summers is the best-selling author. She's a journalist, she's a thought leader. She's got a long career in politics, the media business. And if you mention her name in Australia, she is the person who people say, yes, of course, she has the, she, I have been to, to her books to read and understand feminist thinking amongst many other things. So she wrote Damned Whores and God's Police, Ducks on the Pond, The End of Equality, On Luck, The Lost Mother. And this book, The Misogyny Factor, was triggered, I think, really, by the Julia Gillard debates and everything that happened to the prime minister of one of our great democracies. Um, so that was the background for my invitation. And I'm going to hand over to Anne to talk about the book, the trigger for the book, some of the thoughts that, uh, that she's had about it and since then, and then we'll have a conversation and then I'll, we'll pass over to you. Thank you, Anne. 
Thank you, Jude. Well, it's great to be here. Uh, great to see such a fantastic uh, crowd. Can you hear me? Um, Jude's told you who I am. Also, I need to tell you who I'm not. Um, <laughs> I'm, I'm not, I'm not Anne Summers, a historian who I think is the same age as me and is often published in the London Review of Books and who was thanked in the acknowledgements by A.S. Byatt in her latest novel. And I got so much cred from this, people saying, wow, wow, A.S. Byatt thanked you. And I had to uh, confess that it wasn't me. And I bet the, that Anne Summers must feel quite annoyed that her books are listed under mine on Amazon. Um, and I'm, nor am I the Anne Summers who sells rampaging rabbits and saucy <laughs> lingerie on the high street, although I can really come through uh, customs at Heathrow without somebody wanting to make that connection. So I say I'm the uh, Antipodean Anne Summers, the Anne Summers from down under. Um, I'm um, speaking about misogyny. Uh, this book came out in May last year, and it was actually finished in about, about this time last year. And when I was talking with my publisher about the title for it, and I'd very much wanted to call it The Misogyny Factor, and she said to me, she loved the title, but she said, had this book been published six months earlier, it would not have been possible to have used that word in the title. So the word has come back uh, with a vengeance, and I think one of the things we'll talk about today is why it's come back, and I can certainly talk to you about why uh, it's back in the Australian context, and I'm sure that you will be interested in the Julia Gillard, um, what happened to her. Um, but if I could just say that there were two things that motivated this book, two um, investigations, if you like, that I set out to uh, undertake in, during, the, during uh, 2012. And the first was to, to look, and I, th these were both done via lectures that I'd been invited to give. And uh, when you're asked to give a lecture, you think, OK, what do I want to know? What, do I what, what am I really dying to find out? And you use the lecture as the excuse to... Uh, find out stuff that you, you're interested in, just hope to God the audience will be too. Um, the first of these lectures, I decided to try and find out why it was that 40 years on, um, we had still not reached equality in Australia. And I dated the 40 years, uh, started 1972, I argue, and that is, is the year in which what I call the Equality Project started in our country, because that was the year in which the Gough Whitlam government was elected, and it was the first government in our history to be elected promising equality of the sexes. And so we have a very clear starting date for the Equality Project. Uh, and it seemed to me that, you know, we've been able to achieve all kinds of major engineering projects, all sorts of, you know, huge projects in our country, but something as simple as equality between the sexes 40 years on, we hadn't been able to do it, why not? So the second thing that I investigated was we, we had a female prime minister at the time. She'd been uh, in power for about two years, and uh, it was becoming very obvious that she was being treated and talked about in ways that were new and unusual and pretty disturbing in our politics. And so, and everybody was sort of saying, well, is it her? Is it because she's female? What is it? So I decided to, as a project to investigate what was being said and done to Julia Gillard. And I came up with a lecture which, is, which I wrote, which has since become quite famous, which is called Her Rights at Work the political persecution of Australia's first female prime minister. Um, and what I did in doing that lecture is I set out to investigate the extent to which she was being treated differently as a woman and because she was a woman than if she were just another male politician. And in the course of doing this research, I, w I, was, I sent out alerts on Facebook and used, used social media very extensively to ask people to send me examples of ways in which she was being treated that they thought were objectionable. And I was completely shocked at what came back because I thought that we were, well, it, was, it was well known that a senator had called her deliberately barren. You know, it was well known that a business leader had called her an unproductive old cow. You know, it was well known that the opposition leader, who's now our prime minister, had said she should make an honest woman of herself uh, by supporting a particular bill. Uh, all these things were well known. It was also well known that there'd been a demonstration outside Parliament House one day objecting to the carbon tax, and the signs outside were being held outside Parliament House by the demonstrators who were against a carbon tax were saying things like, ditch the witch, and Bob, Bob Brown, who was then a Green Senator, Bob Brown's bitch, 
with photographs of Gillard. So it seemed to me this was new, this was not something that we said about any man. But then the example started coming in and people started sending me um, extraordinary chain emails, uh, Facebook pages that I had no idea existed, and worst of all, I think, were some um, cartoons that were done by a former mainstream newspaper political cartoonist by the name of Larry Pickering, and he's now just works for himself, but he has a sort of, he peddles in the hate business. He used to do a daily cartoon of Julia Gillard wearing a strap-on dildo, um, doing various things to people in the political um, arena. And he would send these cartoons to every single member of parliament on a daily basis. And this went on for months and months and months, and no one said a word. So I put all this material together and used it as documentation for, to, for my speech to show beyond any doubt that she was being treated differently and, and less favourably um, as a woman uh, than had any of her predecessors. And I, I noted in particular that so much of the material that was being used to denigrate her was of a sexual nature. One of the worst things uh, that was distributed was a photograph a naked photograph of a very large woman who was touching herself and it had Julia Gillard's head had been photoshopped on it. And that was circulated around uh, very extensively by email under the headline, I'm still not voting Labor. And after my speech was delivered and after it was published, uh, one of the reactions I had, uh, which is very similar to what you were just talking about, Judy, is so many people, the speech went viral, about 200,000 people read it very, in very short order. A number of people got in touch with me, particularly young women, saying that when they read the speech and they saw the images, they cried. And it was the same thing of being confronted with the level of hostility and of hatred that could be directed at our, at our political leader. And what does that say about the hostility and the hatred that exists towards other women? So the other point that I made in the speech was, and the reason I called it Her Rights at Work, was that I made the case that had she been any other employee, even a senior employee, even a CEO of a major company, she would have been entitled to sue under our sex discrimination legislation for discrimination, for sexual harassment and for bullying. And so I argued that we, the, and I talked to the audience that I delivered this speech to, that we, the audience, we should think of ourselves as the shareholders of this company, Australia, and it is our duty as shareholders to ensure that our CEO is, is working in a non-hostile environment and we therefore were obliged to take steps to remedy this behaviour and to create a, a less hostile workplace. Otherwise we face being sued. Well unfortunately the world's not like that when you're in politics and uh, instead of um, uh, us being sued uh, we threw her out. Uh, well, in fact her party threw her out and then, out, then the people threw her government out. Um, so that's the, those are the two propositions that I looked at. And I, what is the connection between these two things, the failure of the Equality Project and the treatment of our Prime Minister? And I concluded the two were caused by the same thing, and I call that thing the misogyny factor. That's my name, the misogyny factor. And what do I mean by that? I mean, uh, we talk about misogyny, the old-fashioned meaning of the word, of course, is hatred hatred of women, uh, but I think there's actually a bit of a continuum, a bit of a spectrum of attitudes, and at one end is outright hatred, uh, but on this end, and not that far away, this end is hostility. So there's hostility to women on one end, outright hatred on the other. How is this hostility manifested? It's manifested by excluding women. So it's basically uh, the attitude of, of, I describe the misogyny factor as that set of attitudes and practices that are entrenched in the institutions of our society which basically want to exclude women. And we have many, many ways of doing that, um, and we can talk about those in a minute, but one of the favourite, my favourite one, and I'm just going to read you a short passage from the book, is um, one of the favourite ways we tell women that they're not wanted and not welcome in um, the wider world is we have these uh, ridiculous discussions and you'll see this all the time in the newspapers and all the time in women's magazines, can women have it all? And one of these people has to take her glasses off to read. <laughs> it's not just frustrating, but in fact scandalous that the myriad assumptions and let's face it prejudices that lie behind this question have not really altered in more than half a century. 
if we didn't still think deep down that women's primary function is to breed and raise children, the question of all simply would not arise. If we truly accepted the proposition that women and men are equal and equally entitled to enjoy having a family and having a job, we wouldn't be wasting our time having this conversation. Instead, we'd perhaps be telling our kids about the bad old days before the harmonisation of work, family and school. We'd be rolling our eyes at the memory of school holidays that were out of sync with parental holidays and at the way school finished hours before the end of the office day, leaving parents at their wit's end sorting out how to cope. Craziest of all, we'd recall, was how childcare had been seemingly designed by a sadist who expected mothers, yes, yeah, you wouldn't believe it, but it was mums who had to do it back then, to drop kids off on their way to work, then hightail it back through peak hour traffic to pick them up before the centre closed. As for what it cost, well, women would tell their incredulous offspring, I practically worked for nothing by the time I paid the childcare fees. The kids would be amazed to hear that a society that was supposed to be managed by economic rationalists had been unable to figure out that enabling women to get into the full-time workforce in the same proportions as men would increase gross domestic product by 13%, and this was after all the services needed to support women, women's employment, childcare and so on had been purchased. There'd be other horror stories to tell, but by now the kids would be bored by accounts of the olden days when society was so, well, stupid. They take utterly for granted that both women and men can have it all because that's the natural state of affairs and society is organised around this, ensuring that it all works smoothly and equitably. And it is precisely because we in Australia are not having this conversation that I decided to write this book. We are fumbling around the edges of the issues, tinkering with policy, doing quick fixes, but never sitting back and saying, what exactly do we need to do to ensure our society promotes equality and makes it possible for women, as well as men, to live the lives they want? OK, so I'm going to start by uh, also saying that there are, we all have men in our lives who are loving and who love and who care and who want to solve this too. So this is not about uh, men, full stop. Uh, and the, say, can I just interrupt? I should say that when I talk about misogyny, that the misogyny factor, that is not a gendered statement. The attitudes um, can be, those attitudes and assumptions can be held by men and by women. Yep. Um, not all men hold them. Not all, and some women do, plenty of women do, sadly. Um, it's true that the beneficiaries of the system are men, by and large, but I'm certainly not arguing that men are responsible, and there are plenty of individual men who do not feel this way. Okay, so don't feel threatened if you are a man in the audience, please. Um, on the contrary, you, you're, you're here to support all these discussions, and thank you. Um, and you must have looked at a historical journey of misogyny as well. Um, because when you look back, you know, the word witch, I mean, we, we, we are familiar with the fact that there have been lots of moments through history when women have been literally demonized and for their sort of mystery, for their strangeness, for their sexuality, for their otherness. And in fact, you would almost say that the definition of women being other than men suggests as a starting point that the beginning is a man and the other bit is this other thing called a woman. And is that the, is that the start of the problem, the theological definitions almost, that there is a man centrally and creatively in relationship to a divinity and then there's the other bit which can create babies? Well, I must admit I didn't go there. Um, I was more concerned to simply document the current sort of political, uh, economic and social situation for women in Australia in the, at the current time and also to, to deal with, with the Gillard issue. So um, I don't offer any explanations as to why. Um, and I don't think that wasn't the job I set out to do. It was more to document what's happening. But I. It is interesting that the kind of the language of the bitch and the witch has been with us for so long and it, it trips off our tongue so easily. 
when we're talking about women, uh, particularly women uh, in powerful positions. And I guess it's worth asking the question, why is that? Why is that the word that just springs to our mind automatically rather than other words? Mm -hmm. and Oh, I mean, Julia Gillard was the first female Prime Minister of Australia. If Hillary Clinton wins, you know, in the United States, she would be the first woman in the United States to become president. And we already know the kind of vilification that she it, it comes under. Interestingly, Margaret Thatcher, now vilified by the left a great deal, but, but adored by the right, I'm not sure that the climate in which she came to power had as much evidence of misogyny at surface level as we do now. I mean, this is something perhaps for you to, for the audience to consider, but my sense is that as women's power has increased, misogyny has risen up the, 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 um, the sort of cultural, you know, the, the cultural framework to, to counterbalance that woman's power. In other words, that misogyny is tracking women's power in order to try to pull it back. What's, what's I think your sense? There's absolutely no doubt that that's the case. There's absolutely no doubt. That, and this, this, but this is what was such a surprise um, to me, certainly, but I'm sure to a lot of other people um, who witnessed the situation in Australia, is that Julia Gillard, when she was Deputy Prime Minister, was the most popular politician we've had in decades, if not ever. People adored her, absolutely adored her. She was so clever, she was witty, she was, you know, she spoke beautifully, she was, you know, one of the most impressive politicians. She was extremely good on the floor of the House. Uh, you know, in contrast to the nerdy Prime Minister Kevin Rudd, you know, we thought she was wonderful. And when she became Prime Minister, the whole country went into a total rapture for a, about five minutes. Um, but then it just seemed that, and she went to an election where she nearly didn't win, partly because she was undermined by her own side. But then everything just changed almost overnight when she became reviled and vilified. And it, it, it was kind of hard to understand what had happened. I mean, she was suddenly attacked for her clothes. Well, they were exactly the same clothes she used to wear when she was Deputy Prime Minister, but suddenly they were horrible. Um, she was attacked for her earlobes. She was attacked for her hair. She was attacked for... Um, her voice, uh, the fact she was single, the fact she's living in, well, admittedly she was challenged, she was kind of pushing a lot of buttons. She was single, she was um, an atheist, she was, or still is all these things, single, an atheist, um, has no children, living in sin in the, in the official residence, um, redhead, a migrant, uh, Welsh, you know, <laughs> funny voice. <laughs> Um, so there are all these things to kind of... Like peanut butter. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, and, but, but, isn't that anything, but also, anything else would have done too, is my guess. You know, Absolutely. she had all those buttons to press. Absolutely. If those buttons weren't there, are you saying that she would have been left alone? Well, I, mean, I think if she'd had children, she would have been accused of neglecting them. So, I mean, you, know, <laughs> you, you can't win. You can't win. But one of the questions that I've been trying to sort of look at... Um, I mean, the Hillary Clinton situation is going to be a really interesting one. I, I was at the session this morning where we were talking about the newspaper articles and that article by Louise Mensch mm -hmm. this morning, which I found to be absolutely despicable, uh, where she is reporting uh, this, this apparent story that Hillary Clinton won't run because she has a brain tumour. Now, anyone who's been following American politics at all would know that this idea that Hillary Clinton has a brain tumour is being peddled not by the Republicans but by the extreme loony right. Um, they're, the, they're the same sort of people who say that um, um, Chelsea Clinton's father is not Bill Clinton but is Vince Foster, who many of you might remember was uh, a senior official in the Clinton White House who had been a partner in Hillary Clinton's law firm in Arkansas and according to the loony right, she had an affair with him. Um, she then had him, mur he committed suicide in the White House. But according to the loony right, she actually had him murdered and disposed of the body. I mean, it's all part of this crazy stuff. And see, these guys are now back with these preemptive strikes, trying to create um, rumors, if you like, or scares about her health, which would be the one thing that would ensure that she couldn't run uh, her, her, her health. But the other thing I'd like to say is that when you look at countries around the world where there have been women leaders, and I've got, I have, have done a little uh, research on this, because I think it's very um, telling that these issues that we're talking about are very um, 
widespread. They're not just Anglo-Saxon cultures that have this problem. If we look at, since the first female elected leader, who was Mrs. Bandaranaike in Sri Lanka, uh, back in 1960. Since then, there have been 64 elected women leaders. There are currently 19 today in the world, 19. Um, how many countries of the 64 have had more than one? Nine. And some of those countries are extremely small, not wishing to be rude about them, but um, when we look at some of the major countries, this one included, You've had one female prime minister, that was, uh, you know, the 30 years ago. So it, it's, there's a lesson there, I think, is that, that a lot of countries find it very difficult to come to terms with being governed by a woman. And they might do it once, they rarely do it again. Mm -hmm. So the, the Gillard situation, I think, is, and she herself says this, I interviewed her last year after she left office, and, and she described her situation as being a kind of a perfect storm um, whereby she was the f first female prime minister at a time when we had a minority government, which made our politics have become particularly toxic, but it was also a time in which social media, you know, was widespread and anyone can be a publisher and anyone can go online and say anything about anybody without any constraints at all, and they do, and we saw that they did. And so she sort of hit, she got abuse uh, within the mainstream political system uh, because of the uh, hung parliament, the minority parliament, but she also copped all this abuse from all these sort of, if you like, freelance um, uh, commentators who just took to the internet and created Facebook, you know, there were Facebook pages, I hate Julia Gillard, how can I count the ways, all that sort of thing, that just didn't exist, say, when Margaret Thatcher was in power. So, you know, then she might have been criticised and Labour Party said some pretty horrible things about her, but it was more um, contained than, than today's political dialogues. Mm -hmm. uh, what happened in Australia when she was under such attack? I mean, you, you know, you just said that these horrific images were being sent round to politicians every single day. They didn't say anything. Uh, that the, the, the country was aware that she was under this terrible psychological siege. And also, in terms of, you know, women everywhere in Australia, their female representative was being denigrated, which has a cascading effect, I think, onto images of oneself. Did the women of Australia say enough is enough? Did, you know, what was, was there a collective movement of outrage? What was women's response to misogyny for their leader? I think there were two things, Jude. The first one, that, that one of the things that I was able to do with that speech was I, I just discovered and, the, and therefore documented stuff that had been um, not widely known. I mean, I didn't know a lot of it. I was sh completely shocked to discover this stuff. And I, I was counseled by a lot of people not to publish it. They said, look, this stuff's disgusting, don't publish it. And I decided, no, that we had to publish it. We had to throw a light, shine a light on it and let people see that, okay, it might not have been mainstream, but it was extensive. You could actually document on Facebook, you know, the number of people who were liking and, and following some of these things. And they were in the hundreds of thousands. So, you know, we're not talking about two men at the pub, you know, slagging off about somebody. We're talking about hundreds of thousands of people sharing this disgusting material. So I felt that we had to let people know because I felt that even people who were politically opposed to her, or I like to think anyway, would have been decent enough to say, well, this is not acceptable to treat anybody this way, regardless of what we think about her politics. And I think a lot of people did feel that way, not just women, but particularly women. Um, they, they felt... Um, they felt personally um, aggrieved because you know, if they can do that to her, they can do that to me. But I think the other th it had the other impact of just reducing her legitimacy as a politician because if she's continually depicted only as a sexual being, wearing a dildo or wearing a strap on, engaged in sexual acts, um, how can you treat that person seriously as your prime minister with this sort of, sort of imagery uh, this sort of iconography being developed around her. So it was a very deliberate ploy designed to undermine her legitimacy, and it worked. And it particularly worked because some of the major people who were peddling it were on her own side of politics. So it's, it's really quite um, dispiriting, I think, to realise how many 
people, including people we think are our friends, our political friends, are willing to use these kind of tactics to undermine a woman in power. So when I was you know, so distressed about women in Egypt really being abused and humiliated for being political activists, I began to make the connection between that and Julia Gillard, or that and any female activist, female leader, etc., because it seemed that sex was the demeaning ingredient that you could put in. Sex or madness or hysteria, you know, a, a, terms that were to do with uh, wildness, uh, debauchery, uh, anything that suggested that they weren't, as you say, legitimate, and that actually we were con these things were all connected, and that unless a woman was prepared to assist power rather than have power, then actually she, uh, a force has started to be building around that, that that would make sure that she was sort of put back in the box, if you like. I think it's particularly um, prevalent with women who are a bit younger, and by that I mean under 60, um, or maybe under 50, but, but, but then there are plenty of women at, around in, in, in the world at the moment who've got very important political jobs who are in their 40s and 50s. And they are, and Julia Gillard was, well, she was 51, I think, when she was deposed, so she was fairly young. Um, for example, the woman, Laura Poldrini, I think her name is, just become the Speaker of the Italian Parliament. I mean, the stuff that she's being subjected to is as bad, if not worse, than anything Gillard put up with. There are photographs of, uh, that I, there was an article, I read this in The Guardian a few months ago, uh, photo, very gruesome photographs of a woman being raped you know, with her head you know, photoshopped onto it. So this kind of thing um, is everywhere. The sort of jo jokes that are told about Hillary Clinton, I mean, we all saw that back in 2008 when she uh, ran for the Democratic primary and was um, and defeated by Barack Obama. But she was against, you know, there were things, you could go to the airport and they'd be selling these things to Hillary Nutcracker, you know, you'd stick the nut between her thighs. Uh, to you know, These were just everywhere. All these kind of sex toys, all these kind of sexual jokes that were very well documented, in fact, by Robin Morgan, um, who did a version, a, re a revisitation of a very famous polemic from the 1970s called Goodbye to All That, which was saying goodbye to all the old sexes and that we thought we were waving goodbye back then. And she did a, a document which is well worth looking up called Goodbye to All That Part Two, where she documented the way in which Hillary Clinton had been sexually vilified throughout that campaign. And I have absolutely no doubt that if she does run for 2016, it'll be on again. And it'll be worse now because the tools we have available to us and the threshold for what's horrible has, has, has been um, crossed in a way. So the stuff that's done to Laura Baldrani or the stuff that was done to Julia Gillard is now the new norm, I guess. So what do you do next? I guess it's going to become even more violent. Yeah, and I, and I am confused myself as whether you know, social media obviously gives people the tools to peddle horrible behavior. But I'm not sure whether I think, well, that behavior was still like that, it's just we can disperse it more freely now. Or whether actually the, the tolerance of misogyny has changed. In other words, that the, the outpouring of it, you know, has become greater, as well as the tools by which it can be dispersed. Well, so these are the sorts of questions that we, we have to kind of grapple with because I don't think we really know the answer. Um, I mean, why is violence amongst women increasing in countries, I'm sure it is in Britain too, but certainly in countries like Australia, economically, you know, reasonably well-off countries, why is violence increasing? What is it uh, about our society that is making men turn on women in physical ways that we would have thought, and perhaps we might have liked to have imagined, would might be associated with a, you know, less advanced or less economically advanced country. And I do think there's a, you know, there is an element of payback amongst some men cannot cope with the fact that their wives might be earning more than them, or that their wives might have a job and they've just lost theirs. I think that's a big element. Uh, one of the saddest things that, that we find in Australia, and I wouldn't be surprised if it was true here also, that every woman's refuge in Sydney is full all the time, mostly with refugee women. So you know, the, the, the strains and the, the incredible pressure that, that families and people are under uh, often is expressed in violence against 
the even more vulnerable person in that situation, the woman. So these things have always been with us. The ways of expressing them um, are perhaps a little bit easier, but I also think the context is different because the more uh, women become free, the more th that we do participate equally in society, the more this is resented by certain people and the more they want to pull us down. So that's the frightening thing, that it's, this, this, this is why, you know, this is why we have to use the M word, you know, let's not pussyfoot about, this is serious, they don't want us there, or oh, some of them, they don't want us there and they'll do anything to stop us. And this is why, you know, I think this is a pretty urgent situation. I think, you know, four years ago we had, uh, is feminism the new F word? And really it seems inappropriate to raise that question now because feminism has been a word that a lot of women in the last four years have been grateful that it exists. Whereas, you know, four years ago, I'm not saying everybody in this room would call themselves a feminist, but I'm not saying it's, uh, it's wholesale, but we needed a word that said we believe in gender equality. And just to say, you know, we have that in our eyes as a possibility. What is that word? And feminism can be that word. So it's become much more part of our conversation now. But misogyny, as I said to begin with, is a word that we've been frightened of using because we haven't wanted to look like we were saying this, host this level of hostility is endemic. It's actually there and when it's needed, it's pulled out with a vengeance. But really what you're saying is that around the world, there's a connection and it's, it's happening. Yeah. So, I, I mean, I go back to Australia. When Julia Gillard stepped back and everybody realised what an avalanche of, of hate had, had you know, been poured on her, did Australia, man and woman, then have a big debate and go, we are in danger of, of making sure that you know, female leaders just don't come forward in the future. We're in danger of losing half of the population to, the point, to, to leadership because of misogyny. What are we going to do? Well, the night that she was deposed by her party, which meant she lost the job of Prime Minister uh, as well, um, she gave a wonderful speech um, where she said, um, you know, that, that, that nobody really knew yet, it's, still, it's something that we had to try and come to terms with, about what, what gender meant in, in terms of, 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 of her job and what she'd done. And she said gender wasn't nothing, it was, wasn't everything, uh, it was something, but she said we don't know the extent to which it was the the factor. It was certainly a factor, whether or not it was the factor. And the, and she invited Australia to have a conversation, uh, what she called a sophisticated conversation, going forward to try and sort of tease out those shades of grey to try and understand the extent to which gender was the determining factor. And I think that's what we have to do. And I think, um, you know, we have, the thing about misogyny, it is a frightening thing, but we have to name it, we have to expose it in order to combat it. I do think that, you know, for all of the terrible treatment of her, that a lot of Australians felt very, very ashamed afterwards. And I think they still do. And, and, we, and you know, there's, there's a lot of sort of collective wringing of hands and, and thinking, how could we have let this happen? And how can we make sure, not only make sure it doesn't happen again, make, but make sure that young women aren't deterred from entering politics. Uh, this, and that I know is Gillard herself, that's her, one of her biggest concerns. She doesn't want, because um, she says, one of the things she was most, she said on the, her, that last night, one of the things that she was very certain of was that it would be easier for the next woman and the woman after that and the woman after that. And that made it all worthwhile for her. Now, I think she's being a little optimistic. Uh, I think she had to say that, and uh, I hope she's right, but I'm not quite as sanguine as that. But there is no doubt that we have to fight it, and the only way to fight it is in, in numbers, with more and more young women going into politics, and we have to change that system. Okay, so obviously misogyny doesn't just exist in the political sphere, it exists in all kinds of contexts. And I want to give a little example. Natasha McElhenney, who did the papers this morning, said that she yesterday was with her, she's got three boys, and they were playing with a friend's boy. Her friend doesn't work. And she was with the childminder. She said, well, I've got to go now. And the little boy, had not hers, but the, the friend, the little boy, who's five, said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to work. And he said, women don't work. Totally innocently, because his mother doesn't work. And some of the 
ideas that children have really early on, and then we hear this from the under 10s feminist corner, you know, the girls saying what happens in the playground and how boys are told about entitlement and how girls have to fight for entitlement. If at seven a boy is being violent to a girl in the playground because actually she is claiming equal rights when you know, he's basically been brought up already to feel, well, you'll have the rights I give you. Uh, I can be nice, I can be generous, I can withdraw the rights as well. If that is what is being taught still to children in the playground, and in some cultures it's absolutely a given, but in other cultures like our own, it's a sort of general trend that we choose to hope will progress away of its own accord, but it doesn't seem to be. Well, that's what I find, uh, you know, a bit depressing because, let's say, 40 years on, or 42 years on now, um, you know, we thought, those of us who were around in the early days of the women's movement in the 19, late 1960s and early 1970s, um, you know, as, as so many things changed back then, we, and this is another thing I deal with in the book, you know, how come, you know, we have, we have progress but we don't have success. Um, we thought as we changed things for the good and as more girls went to education, that's been one of our big success stories, that the entrance of girls and, uh, into education, the graduation from university and, and higher education. But we thought as all of these things changed, we thought, OK, we've done that, tick, move on to the next thing. It's like we thought when we, Julia Gillard, OK, we finally got our first woman minister, prime minister, tick, you know, let's, let's, get, let's see whether she's going to be good or bad or will she break our hearts. It never occurred to us that this whole thing would happen. So that one of the very sobering things, I think, for people like me who've been around since the second wave of the, of the women's movement is that just because we have won something doesn't mean it's secure, that we have had some backtracking and that some of the things that we... Uh, like, you know, abortion rights are under threat everywhere. Some of the things that we thought we had won, we thought were secure. And, you know, you think once you've achieved um, progress and, and once you've achieved what, um, you know, it, to, to me, it's an undeniably good thing, uh, how could you possibly reverse it? And one of the things that I think, I argue this in the book, one of the things that I think we underestimated as uh, baby feminists was um, we thought that everybody thought equality was a good idea. We were wrong. It, it's probably inevitable that equality doesn't feel like a good idea if you are in charge and have power and enjoy it. Um, I mean, it sounds naive then to sort of go, well, you wouldn't mind moving over and sharing, would you? Because, you know, we know that that's not the case. And, and a really brilliant historian rapper, Akala, who worked on the Man's Festival and was on the Man's se pa uh, session yesterday, said, well, powerful people are inevitably lazy because they don't have to inquire or find out about how, their circum how other people's circumstances are. So they don't even notice other people's circumstances. And then also, as soon as they feel the tug of change, they resist with all their power. Um, th th I, just before we ask questions from the audience, and I'm particularly interested in all those young women who are sitting over there um, on the floor, actually, which is the... the I went and did a, a thing in the... Um, uh, party conferences recently, and many, many women MPs said that they were withdrawing from Parliament, that they didn't realise what it was going to be like, and had they known, they wouldn't have gone into it, and they won't be doing it again. That really frightened me. The other night, I spoke to Harriet Harman's advisor. She said that the storm that has whirled around her uh, over this whole you know, um, civil liberties period in the 70s uh, was unbelievable unbelievable, even down to it being tweeted when she went to Oxford um, to give a speech the other day, that her butterfly brooch was actually a symbol of lesbian paedophiles. Of course, everyone knows that. Everybody knows that, of course, yeah. <laughs> um, and, and that she actually had to take the brooch off, really. She, they, they, she, her advisors asked her to take the brooch off because it was a Twitter storm everywhere. And, you know, again, I felt personally like you do, I felt a bit sh ashamed that, that, that we hadn't just all found a way of saying, right, whatever we believe about any political party member, if it's a woman, shouldn't we be protecting her rights as a woman, regardless of, you know, agreeing whether or not she, she does or doesn't present this bill to the House? And your point about her being entitled to rights 
right not to be bullied, and right not to be sexually harassed. If we don't protect our, our democratically voted leaders, then we have much less chance of protecting ourselves. Well, I think we, we, we have to apply that, that is those standards to everyone. So I think we have to treat each other, men and women, by the same standards. And I mean, if we were to treat women by the same standards men are treated, that would already be a big improvement. Um, but I, I think when it comes to politics, I mean, politics is a very brutal, vicious game. I mean, you don't go into it if you're uh, faint-hearted. Uh, so I, I don't think that we can necessarily turn the temperature down that much in politics and still, you know, that, that's a other, whole other project and I can't see that happening. But what we can do is that within the kinds of, you know, contests that you have in the political arena, we can kind of limit the weaponry. Now we can limit the weaponry to, we can still be, show a little bit more respect. I remember in the Australian Parliament about 10 years ago, they had a very, very good debate after one of the, it happened to be a male member of parliament attempted suicide. And he didn't succeed, but it gave everyone a terrible fright. And so the whole parliament sort of had, went into this great self you know, examination. We've got to start treating each other better. Now it's a, a terrible shame they didn't have the same kind of debate after Julia Gillard. That wasn't seen as anything like the same kind of crisis, um, which in itself says a lot. Uh, but I do think that we have to try and uh, improve the discourse generally, treat each other better, watch the kind of language we use, not use those kind of sexual stereotypes. And uh, I mean, one of the things that I did with my speech in the end, after showing people all these horrible images and, and, and just sort of laying out how awful it was, I said, well, look, rather than just, you know, wringing our hands, what are we going to do about this, is that we as individuals do have the power to take action, and we should. And so I suggested that we, and I actually adopted a slogan that was being used in Australia at the time, and still is, by the Race Discrimination Commissioner. They were running a campaign that said, it stops with me. So whenever you encounter a racist, um, you know, example of racism, you say to that person, it stops with me. So I suggested we use this, and whenever we encountered an example of vilification of, of Gillard, uh, be it if you receive one of these emails or if somebody, you know, said, oh, you know, that old cow or whatever, to you, to, that you say to them, no, you know, it's, it stops with me, I'm not going to tolerate this. And it was very interesting that a lot of people got in touch with me, including a lot of men wrote to me, and one in particular that sticks in my mind, he's, um, I don't know, a lawyer or something, and he said that he used to get all these emails and he thought they were funny. You know, he saw nothing wrong with them and he used to just forward them onto all his mates, so you know, they'd end up going to hundreds of, And he said, having read, read my speech, he realised that it was wrong and he said, it stops with me, I wanted you to know that. And I, I found that you know, people felt able to take control of at least a little bit of this world and try and stop things. And uh, I think that we, 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 we can't, we've got to have some kind of optimism. We've got to have some ability to feel we can change things. And so I think, you know, we can be like one woman warriors and, and uh, do what we can. I'd like to thank Anne Summers.